The reading today is from Luke's Gospel, chapter 14, starting at verse 12, and that's on page 874 of the Church Bibles. Luke 14, 12 to 24. He said also to the man who had invited him, when you give a dinner or a banquet, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors, lest they also invite you in return and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you'll be repaid at the resurrection of the just. When one of those who reclined at table with him heard these things, he said to him, Blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. But he said to him, A man once gave a great banquet and invited many. And at the time for the banquet, he sent his servant to say to those who had been invited, Come, for now everything is ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said to him, I have bought a field and I must go out and see it. Please excuse me. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I'm going to examine them. Please excuse me. And another said, I have married a wife and therefore I cannot come. So the servant came and reported these things to his master. Then the master of the house became angry and said to his servant, Go out quickly to the streets and lanes of the city and bring in the poor and crippled and blind and lame. And the servant said, Sir, what you commanded has been done and there there still is room. And the master said to the servant, Go out to the highways and hedges and compel people to come in, that my house may be filled. For I tell you, none of those men who were invited shall taste my banquet. Well, as Chris said, a very, very warm welcome to St. Nick's. Thank you for joining us this morning. Can you hear me okay? Kind of. Uh, Am I definitely on? Yeah, Sam can hear me at the back, so we're fine. It's great to have you with us. Please do keep that passage open in front of you as we look at this, yet again, punchy parable spoken by the Lord Jesus to the Jewish religious establishment. Now, I want to begin today by asking a question. Why is it that Jesus' offer of salvation was rejected, that God's saviour was rejected by the religious establishment of his day. Why is it that today so many people reject God's offer of salvation? I've got a wedding invite here. It's from my brother, actually. And um, it's got some nice flowers on the front and the details and all the rest of it. And don't worry, this is actually um, just a sort of a head, one of those heads up saying something more is to come. And I've now got the proper invite. So this was in my recycling. But why is it... But people, in effect, do this with God's invite to heaven, his offer of salvation. Why do they do that? Just rip it up and put it in the bin. That is the question I want us to consider this morning. That is the issue Jesus is dealing with in history as the religious establishment do that to God's promised salvation offered to them, promised to them, but now as it comes to them, they reject it. Well, we're going to look at this parable together, and we're going to make a couple of observations. The first one is this, the rudeness of their excuses, and then secondly, we'll consider the reason for their excuses. So firstly, consider the excuses that we come to in the parable that Jesus tells. He's obviously telling it against the people he's at dinner with. The context we have in verse 1 of chapter 14, have a look at it with me. He's been invited to a dinner with the ruler of the Pharisees, but we're told that they're watching him carefully. They're out to get him. They're rejecting him. And he's telling this uh, parable against them. He's saying that God's salvation and heaven is like a great banquet gloriously generous and satisfying 
uh, something which is being laid on by God. And God has sent his servant into the world, Jesus, because it's now time to take hold of this salvation. Everything is ready. Jesus is to make the great sacrifice for sin to provide for this salvation. And so he's come to call people in, but like the men in the parable, the religious establishment are saying, no, thank you, and declining the original invitation. And the first thing Jesus does is he, he shows us that that rejection is not for good reasons. In fact, their excuses are incredibly rude in the parable, aren't they? They've got something in common. Um, it's very relatable. The reasons that they give are very relatable, although rude. I think the thing they have in common is, that, is novelty, that they all have something new, don't they? So um, the newly acquired field is the first excuse. Um, so that's verse 18. They all began to make excuses. The first said, I've bought a field and I must go out and see it. And then we have next the newly acquired oxen. Verse 19, I've bought five yoke of oxen. And then in verse 20, the newly married man, I've married a wife, I can't come. And we love novelty, don't we? We're obsessed with the new. I suppose that's why Jeff Bezos has made himself one of the richest men in the world. Amazon Prime surely proves that by nature humans want new things and we want them now. And that's what Amazon Prime offers us. And when the box arrives and we finally get through all that stringy stuff and the tape, We can't take our mind off the new object, can we, for at least five minutes anyway. And perhaps these people, they're so engrossed in the new thing that they've got, whether it's the sort of new business venture, the new property, the new marriage, the extended sort of five-year honeymoon, that they're they're just too busy now to come to this uh, thing they were invited to. Perhaps that's what it is. If that is what it is, they're just engrossed in the new, well, it's still very rude, isn't it? It's incredibly rude. But verse 18 suggests that actually it's not so much that they're they're engrossed and they're genuinely doing this, but actually they're making up excuses to come, to get out of coming. Have a look at verse 18. They all alike began to make excuses, not to give their apologies. I'm so sorry, my house is on fire. I really genuinely can't come. I'd wanted to, but I... I can't come. No, no, it's much more. um, Yeah, um, let me make an excuse. So I'm washing my hair tonight. I can't come. They are making excuses. And I think that's the point of the excuses that we encounter, at least in the first two. So have a look again at verse 18 in the first excuse and just think about it. I bought a field. I don't know how much a field costs. In today's money, tens of thousands of pounds at least, if you're sort of up in Scotland somewhere perhaps, get anywhere near to London and you're talking hundreds of thousands perhaps. I bought a field, I must go out and see it. Just ask yourself for a moment, who spends that sort of money without first going and seeing it? And check it, have you ever bought a house over the phone without having looked at it, even seen a picture? Of course not, who goes to buy a car? without first checking it. Now, I wouldn't know what to do. I I don't know what to do when I go and look at a car as if to buy it, sort of look and make sure it's got four wheels and an engine under the bonnet, that kind of thing. I don't know what I'm doing, but instinct tells us that you inspect it first, not afterwards. And yet this man is saying, I'm so sorry, I bought a field. I I must go and examine it. You sense that he's really scrabbling around to make up an excuse for not coming. And even if he really did have to go and inspect it for whatever reason, couldn't he do it the next day? Either way, the excuse is unbelievably rude. And the same happens in the the next excuse, doesn't it? I've bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to examine them. Really? Um, I'm no expert at cars, but having watched Clarkson's Farm, I am now an absolute expert when it comes to farming. And um, I I could tell you lots about farming. And again, there's a very simple principle. Even if you buy some cheap livestock like sheep, uh, Jeremy Clarkson goes to see them first. Uh, But these are oxen, five five yokes of them. They are bulls, cows, 
incredibly expensive. I have a friend who grew up on a farm, and as a boy, I used to spend my pocket money you know, on cap guns and stuff like this. He saved his up and bought a cow. And he pointed his cow out, and then I asked him how much it was, and it nearly blew my mind. It was ridiculously expensive. But my friend didn't buy that cow over the phone. He checked it out first. So these excuses, they are pathetic. They're, they're, it feels like they're being made up. But either way, they're very rude. And the last one is the rudest of them all, aren't they? Isn't it? Have a look at verse 20. It's not really an excuse. He's not trying at this stage. I've married a wife, therefore I cannot come. What sort of excuse is that? Invite her! And unlike the others, he doesn't say, please have me excused. He just says, Soz can't come. And we get that a lot today, actually, don't we? I've got something better cut going on now. I know I said I'd come, but I've been invited to a party by someone who's even cooler than the person who originally invited me and say, sorry, I can't come. And we, we hate this sort of flakiness, don't we? To cancel two hours before the party is way worse than saying no to it originally. And there's just a real rudeness to these excuses. And the boffins tell us that in Palestine, when a man made a feast like this, uh, the day of it was announced way in advance, and the invites would go out, and people would accept them. But the hour wouldn't be announced. And so when things were finally ready, and the hour had come, the servants would go out and say, it's ready, come on. You said you were coming, off we go. Let's go and have dinner together. Uh, and in the culture, to accept the invitation beforehand and then refuse it when the day came was grave and serious an insult. And of course it is, isn't it? When you consider the cost, this is a great banquet. This is a huge event that they are now turning down at the last minute. I'm told that in sort of posh upper crust circles, people who go shooting and things like that, I've never been shooting, um, but people who do, I'm told that an unwritten rule is that if you RSVP to a shooting weekend accepting the invite, you can only cancel if A, you are dead, or B, a close member of your family dies shortly beforehand. Well, I don't know how you, are, how you cancel if you have died, personally, but you sort of understand the sentiment, don't you? Something so important, so expensive to host, you don't cancel. You just don't do that. It's rude. And to step back, what Jesus is clearly saying, it's not that Jesus has been given excuses by the Pharisees, He's just making the point that right now, as you reject God's salvation, you're being incredibly rude. There is no excuse. And so as we look back at Jesus in history, and we sort of scratch our heads and think, what on earth the Messiah promised, revealed by prophets over centuries to Israel, comes into the nation, fulfilling all the prophecies with all the evidence, and yet the religious establishment make their assessment and reject him. And we think, well, are we missing something? Were they right? No, they were just incredibly rude. <laughs> They outright rejected God's salvation. And that brings us to our second heading. As we consider the, rude, the rudeness and its reason, what was the reason for this rudeness? Well, I think when I've normally studied this parable, I thought, well, here at three excuses which are very relatable. You know, business, my, my job, uh, property perhaps, something like that, uh, relationships. And these are classic reasons people turn down Christianity, which is true. You know, Christ came into the world and he said there's going to be a cost, didn't he? And so people weigh up that cost and think, well, I'm sorry, I'm just not willing to, to experience the cost. I'll prioritize these things. But that's not what's going on in this parable. Although that's true, and that may be a reason, that's not actually what we're reading about in the parable, is it? Right now, at this very moment in the parable, these men are being told, come to the feast. Come to heaven right now. 
They're not being told to go to prison. It's not a drill sergeant recruiting them for the army. A, a great feast is literally ready at this very moment. The meat is smoking on the table. The aged wine is breathing. The conversation awaits. The festivities are soon to be flowing. It's a wonderful invitation, and they've accepted it, and now it's all ready. And yet, bizarrely, they make their excuses. Why? What would you say? Why? In the parable, are they now making their excuses? It surely has to be that, really, they never wanted to come. They don't actually want to go to this feast, glorious as it may be. We're not told why. I suspect it might be the host. But these men, they don't want to come. If they were honest, they would say, I never planned to come, and I really don't want to come. And I'm not going to. And that is the real reason for Jesus' rejection. He came into the world to bring salvation to open heaven. And this is the reason the religious establishment rejected him. They didn't actually want God's salvation. Now, they may have put on a pious show. Do you remember back in um, the beginning of our passage... Jesus has been um, challenging them, and it's all a bit awkward, and one of the guests replies, blessed are those who will break bread in the kingdom of God. You know, oh yes, we can't wait for heaven. Show of piety. But the point of this parable is to call that out. It's just a show. Really, they don't want God's salvation. They may want the trappings, the trappings of heaven. Blessed are those who break bread. But what they don't want is the God who is there. The God who has come to them to bring this salvation. And we just need to understand that so that we are realistic about our ministry in this world This is the fundamental issue. We can reason people with people over the cost and say, look, it's worth it in eternity. But even as you reason, deep down, humanity by nature doesn't want God's salvation. Not if it involves God. Yes, we know most people cling to some hope of heaven, that they'll see so-and-so again, that death won't be the end. But ask them honestly, do you want God? And the answer will be no, if they're honest or objective about it. Charles Spurgeon gets right to the heart of the issue rather more bluntly than that, and in Victorian language. Truly here, we have a picture of the universal depravity of man. All men are thus vile and refuse the mercy of God. And we never know how bad man really is until the gospel is preached to him. Here, human nature reaches to the greatest height of sin's enormity, spitting forth his venom against the Lord of infinite love. Man proves himself truly to be the serpent's brood. But of course, these words do feel harsh because that's not how it it appears, really, is it? How many people really are so brazen and, and literally sort of rip up the invitation? Not many are that brazen with God or with you if you offer them salvation. People tend to be, although fundamentally in the parable, rude, tend to be polite on the surface. So look at the parable again and notice that they are making excuses and they are being polite. End of verse 18, please excuse me. 
end of verse 19. Please excuse me. You know, there's, there's a semblance of politeness. But deep down, these men don't want to go. Their excuses to get out of it. I married my um, sister and her fiancé this summer, and it was a lovely time. Lots of my extended family were there, who I know very well. And I know lots of them really have no interest in Christianity. But you know, on, on the day, it was all politeness. <laughs> and uh, on the day, some of them really talked a good game about Christian things. And that's what we tend to be like even though in truth, deep down, I want nothing to do with God. And that was the Pharisees. Don't you wonder ever how people who seem so pious in so many ways, concerned for God's laws and the right interpretation of them, all these sorts of things, could yet nonetheless reject the Messiah? How do you put the two together? Well, human nature, they were human, and deep down, They didn't want God. And so be realistic, I suppose, is one of the applications of our passage. Don't be shaken by rejection, but do be realistic that it will happen. Polite rejection. I was wondering, why in the parable do these people accept the initial invitation at all? You know, they're clearly planning not to go, and you do lose face by at the last minute not going, So why not just say no to begin with? Well, I suppose though by nature we are rebels as human beings, we're cowards. And it's a brave thing just to come out and say it. And few people really come out and say what they mean to God by nature. And then there's conscience. I suppose these men said yes initially because they knew that this man's generosity demanded at least courtesy if not gratitude, and they claims on them. And so they said yes, and then just at the last minute made their excuses. People do that on WhatsApp all the time, don't they? The sort of um, appeal goes out to a group, oh, let's um, find a time to get together, here are some dates, and so they're so friend of advance, you just have to say yes to some of them. I'll just make an excuse later. Because, you know, they have a claim on your courtesy. And I suppose that may have been what was going on, but in truth... They just didn't want to go. And this is human nature, and it does make God very angry. Have a look at the parable with me. The man comes back to report these various excuses, and in verse 20 we read this, the servant came and reported these things to the master, And then the master of the house became angry and said to the servant, go out quickly to the streets and lanes of the city and bring in the poor and crippled and blind and lame. And the servant said, sir, what you've commanded has been done. Still there's room. And the master said to the servant, go out to the highways and hedges and compel people to come in that my house may be filled. For I tell you, not one of those men who were invited shall taste my banquet." Now imagine Jesus as he says that at this dinner with people who are rejecting the offer of salvation. It's a warning. If you go on rejecting it, well, you just won't be there on the final day. God will give you exactly what you wanted, in a sense. But at the same time, isn't it glorious that in God's providence and sovereignty... Jesus' rejection by the religious establishment then gives way to the gospel going out to the entire world. The invitation going out far and wide. First of all, it goes, as Jesus says, to the poor and crippled, blind and lame. And then there's still room in God's house and he's determined to fill it. And so it goes to those who are in the highways and the hedgerows, to people like us. But notice, even with those who are in the highways and the hedgerows, the people who have the least, what does the master say to the servant, the father say to the son? He says, look at the end of verse 23, 
compel people to come in. Isn't it an amazing thought that no one in this room, if you're a Christian, is here because you chose to come to Jesus? That's not us by nature. God compelled you to come in. God sent you his word with his spirits and caused you to respond to his son and to come to the banquet. And now, of course, verse 23 is the application for us. We play our role with the son, with the servant, in bringing people in. I bought a prop. Um, Here's a tankard from my house. Um, It's an army regimental tankard. Two Tom. No, it's not to Tom. I wish it was. It's not to Tom. From East, a slightly cryptic uh, nickname for a regiment, 1989. And then the rather ominous um, motto, printed below it, engraved below it. Go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in. St. Luke chapter 14, verse 23. Slightly ominous and a very dubious use of a Bible text. Of course, this verse is not talking uh, uh, about um, armies going and fighting their enemies and it's certainly not saying go and force people to become Christians by force like the Roman Catholic Church did many centuries ago. Of course it's not saying that. The point of a parable is that you can't. You cannot persuade anyone to come to the banquet. That's the point. Be realistic. But Jesus can. And that is what he's doing in this closing age of humanity. Through his word, by his spirit, as we partner with him in this work. And so verse 23 is our watchword. Go and compel them. Take them the word as you pray. And gloriously, God's house will be filled. I was out on um, the Woolworth Road yesterday and there were loads of teenagers with yellow t-shirts on that said Jesus saves and these balloons that says um, it's a God thing. Don't know what that means, but um, there they were. It was a great sight. I, I hope they were communicating the gospel. I- I'm sure if they were, they met with a huge amount of disappointment, people turning them away with varying degrees of politeness, some people honest enough just to be quite rude, I suppose. Uh, and it's good to be realistic, isn't it? But at the same time, their efforts and labors won't have been in vain if they're preaching the gospel because God is determined to fill his house. He'll do it. And so as we are realistic about, I don't know, the the ministry we're engaged in, in the offices, as we go to September thinking about, you know, my own personal ministry or as we get together as a small group and think, what might we do together? Well, we need to be realistic. There's no clever strategy that's going to work. Jesus must compel them. But he will. The Father will have his house filled. And so be realistic, but be confident and pray. Uh, A couple of weeks ago, I was in Kent and I popped into a charity shop. I cannot resist the charity shop when I pass on by, so I always pop in. You never know what you're going to find. And there were some old books, and um, you may have noticed I do quite like old books. And um, it was about George Muller, a man who was Christian in the 18th century, obviously. And um, he was an amazing man used by God mightily. He was famous for his prayer life. He took God at his word and prayed specifically for people. He'd write his prayers down. And then when they were answered, he'd show the people he'd pray for the answers to those prayers. And he had thousands and thousands of prayers answered. But, you know, back in the day, when he was a lad, he was a... The only word is a total reprobate. His dad um, was so sort of despairing about his son that he decided the only thing to do with him was to send him off to join the religious establishment. So he's he's sent off to train as a monk. But he was quickly kicked out because he'd steal money and go off and get drunk and go off on holidays he wasn't supposed to go on and 
all sorts of things. He ended up in debtor's prison. He'd fabricate lies to his father to explain all this away and then steal more money from his father and his work and all sorts of things. He was a total and utter tearaway. And then one day, um, when he was at university, he was walking with his friend, and he asked his friend what he was doing that night. And um, his friend was actually a bit reluctant to tell him. He said, I, I, I'm going to a gathering of some Christians. We're going to just hear a sermon read out, someone else's sermon being read out, and we're going to sing and pray together. And George Muller said, well, for some bizarre reason, he said, I, I'd quite like to come. <laughs> and the friend, knowing George Muller and what a total and utter terror where he was, didn't really want to invite him. But he gave in, and George Muller came. And you can see, can't you, already, Jesus was compelling George Muller to come to the banquet. And as soon as he got to this gathering, it was like nothing he had ever experienced in his entire life just a group of Christians together, and then he heard the word of God. And immediately something changed, and then for a year, three times a week, he'd come and hear these sermons, and Christ compelled him in. And many people will tear up the invitation. They won't do it in, in a sort of obvious way. It will be polite. But that is what is going on, because by nature, people don't want God or his salvation. But God will fill his house, and he will bring people in. And so as we're realistic, we continue in confidence. So let's pray that we would. We thank you, our sovereign Lord, that each and every one of us in this room who's come to your Son for mercy, to take hold of this wonderful gospel provision, to lay hold of our eternal banquet with you in eternity, to feast at table with you and for all the saints. We thank you that each one of us who's done that has done it because you sovereignly acted to draw us into your kingdom. And we pray that you will do that in our world, that those who are yours you will draw, and that you might be pleased to use our prayers and our pleadings with people to bring many to the final feast. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.